Hi, my name's Phil. I like talking about politics. And in this video, after discussing the dilemmas for the Democrats in America early on, thought I'd discuss some real political dilemmas for a political party in this country. The Green Party had, by their standards, a really good election, netting four parliamentary seats, and for once, not seeing their vote share go down as they lose out to tactical voting. Mind you, as this was the election for tactically voting the Tories into like third place, their gain was our loss. It saved quite a few Tory MPs. But never mind that now. In this, in this video, I want to focus on how the Green Party do have the potential to kick on from here, even with our current rubbish first past the post system, but how it would have to take them well out of their comfort zone. Because people throw the word dilemma around a lot. Oh, I've got this terrible dilemma. What they actually mean is, no, you've got a choice of things to do. And the clearly correct thing to do is the thing you don't want to do. But there are such things as a genuine dilemma where all options are risky, the outcome's uncertain, and the Green Party have at least two of them. I'll cover the main one first because it's by far the most impactful when it comes to their future political future. So let's take a look at the, the sort of four seats they won in the general election this year because there are two types of them. Consider that a year ago, they looked like they would struggle to even retain the seats that they'd won and held under Caroline Lucas. Then due to various circumstances, they managed to win four. Spectacular turnaround that could just as easily and quickly collapse. Now, two of the seats were won against Labour and two were against the Conservatives. The two they won against the Conservatives are most at risk now. They benefited from tactical voting to beat the Tories in those seats. And tactical voting was very mainstream in this election, hence the incredibly weird vote share breakdowns. As the Tories spend more time in opposition, two things are going to happen to weaken the Greens in these seats. First, the Tories have a chance to redeem their reputations by accepting that they failed, making positive sounds about having learned lessons, reconnecting with voters. You know, the things Labour did. I don't know that they're going to do this quickly. They may do, they may not. But if they keep losing elections, they will eventually have to do so. And as with so many seats which flipped, it was more in these seats about the collapse of the Tory vote than gains from others technically. So even if the gains sort of retained their vote and even if Labour and Lib Dem voters in those seats still tactically voted for them to keep the Tories out, a lot of those Tory votes will come back. Now, there is a bit of a caveat here, which I'm going to discuss in another video, hopefully tomorrow, unless other things come up. But that is the general wisdom that when a party's fallen out from government, what's happened is they've lost a lot of votes. When they're in opposition, fix their reputation, no longer being blamed for the things going wrong. Some of that support, which was always conservative, comes back. The other two seats were against Labour. Now, these are arguably easier and harder to hold, depending on how you look at it. Um, a bit easier because Labour are now the government. So the Greens can remain the opposition trying to hold that government to higher standards. So they've got that appeal. But their grip depends not only on how the Greens conduct themselves in opposition, but how Labour perform as well. And there's a bit of a squeeze on both of those things. Like if Labour deliver what many of these voters want and the Greens are seen to oppose those moves, that will weaken the Green Party even here. And this is where they've got a major weakness, because what have the Green Party done? And Parliament hasn't been open that long, right? But what have they done? First thing they did was to oppose moves to decarbonise our industry and transport. That doesn't sound like a very Green Party thing to do. The problem the Greens have is they are associated with responsible Green policies. Uh, indeed, when you looked at the polling, it's like reasons for voting for different parties. When, when Green Party voters were polled after this election, by far the biggest reason was Green policies, right? Makes sense. A lot of voters are fully seized of the urgent need for climate action, right? But their practice in power, first at the council level and now at the parliamentary level, is to oppose everything that moves us to net zero. They, they for example, one of the big jokes is they say, oh, we should have, we should use more public transport, we should use more trains. But then at the council level, they oppose the development of, of railways. It's actually a bit of a meme with the Green Party. We should have more trains. Right, great. Let's get some more rail lines down. No, 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 no. No railways, just trains. But they've also blocked the development of the national grid, including solar projects. Green Party politicians, elected politicians, have actually blocked 
the development of solar projects in their areas. The problem for the Greens is that they have a habit of winning power in very nimby areas. And in order to keep those voters on side, they have to become NIMBY politicians. They're, they're not in theory a NIMBY party, but all of the individual components are NIMBY politicians. Uh, you know, we need more of these things. We need more of this. We need more, we need more housing. We need more low carbon transport. We need more low carbon energy. Just not where we are. Build it somewhere else. Basically build them where we are not. And they've so far gotten away with it because the media ignoring them is a double-edged sword. It means they don't get a fair hearing for their policies, which is unfair. But it also means they don't get this sort of scrutiny of what they actually do when they're elected either. But Labour may well decide to draw attention to it in this Parliament because the Greens, and this is where their opportunity is, are actually challenging Labour in quite a lot of areas. So Labour are incentivised to point this out. So what to do? Well, ironically, the Green Party have a way of sticking to their principles in a way that don't mean double standards and could benefit electorally. But it's, it is risky. Although the gains they've made are in very nimby areas, they don't have to be. The Green Party are, like Reform UK, incredibly inefficient with their vote share. They just try and get votes everywhere so they can hold up their vote share. It's worthless. What you want are seats. They could focus on other areas. They could narrow their focus and win more seats. The growth potential for the Green Party is not in a small number of NIMBY seats where circumstances in this election meant that they uh, won those seats, but different circumstances later on means they could lose all of them. Over the next decade, they could literally lose all of those seats due to other circumstances. Their growth potential actually is largely in the cities where they've been finishing second to Labour in this election. And those are not NIMBY areas. But therein lies the dilemma, a genuine dilemma. If the Green Party allows themselves to be called out for blocking the development of projects which are obviously going to help tackle the climate emergency, and people see that, they're going to lose support. And they'll lose that support everywhere, evenly distributed. If they pivot, instead into supporting those projects and actually say, well, actually, Labour should be going even further and faster because that's what you need to do. It's no good going, oh, yeah, the government's doing brilliantly. That's not opposing. You need to say, OK, yeah, we support this, but actually you should be doing this, this and this as well. Pick on things that actually maybe not politically feasible, but sound good. And they could develop support in some of those urban areas with some of those voters who are the most seized of the need to tackle climate change. But they would lose support in those NIMBY areas that they currently represent. And therein lies the dilemma. Do they get caught out being exposed as blocking moves towards net zero in order to hold on to gains in areas where their policies don't really fit the electorate? Or do they abandon those gains, because they, they probably are going to have to, as stepping stones in pursuit of gains where their policies can be more harmonious with the available voters? It's a risk either way. I mean, that is a risk because there's no guarantee they could take seats that Labour won this year. Because if, if Labour are seen to be delivering in government, actually, that will that'll be a struggle. But it's not there. But at the same time, if they decide, OK, well, let's hold on to what we've got, then they'll still lose some of that support anyway, as Labour try and expose the fact that the Greens keep blocking all these moves that are designed to move us towards net zero. And it's not their only dilemma. As well as one Green co-leader opposing the expansion of the national grid in their area, which is, of course, essential to plans to phase out the use of combustion engines on the road. It's not like the Green Party have an alternative. They don't. Their alternative is, yes, we need these things, build them somewhere else. That is their alternative. But the other co-leader, Carla Denny in this case, upset a lot of Greens today by praising Biden. He's mad. And there's a bit of a clue in a recent poll on whether supporters of various parties think it's more important to stick to principles or compromise to get things done. It will come as no surprise that the two parties who scored highest for ideology above getting things done was Reform UK and the Green Party, largely because their voters don't expect either of them to get anything done. They expect them, you know, when Keir Starmer talked a few years ago at the party conference, do we want to be the party of protest or the party of power? And after over 10 years in opposition, the party has chosen power at last. Um, but Keir Starmer could offer them that choice. He could offer them the choice. 
Reform UK and the Green Party cannot offer their voters that choice. They cannot say to their voters, if we adopt this line, we can win power. They can't. They can maybe win some more seats. And this is their second dilemma. Most voters are pragmatic. Yes, they can be misinformed and vote against their own interests, but that's not their intention. They're not trying to cut off the nose to spite the face. But the loudest voices in politics do. They want that. And the, and the loudest voices in politics are also the most active, but they are also a minority. Will the Green Party keep backing down to the loudest voices, the ones who prioritise purity of ideology over practical outcomes, because they don't believe they can achieve any practical outcomes anyway, so they may as well just make a big fuss? That is possible. Unlike with Labour and the Tories, like I say, they have, they've both done that in recent years. They have both chosen blinkered ideology over getting things done, achieving things. But they also had the option of going, but we could choose power. The Greens cannot say that. They cannot, even if they take a more pragmatic line, win power in the short term. They could try and build towards it in the future. They're not in with a shot of forming a government in this country anytime soon. But it is also the case that they waste a lot of votes. You know, they should really try to find out how their votes are realistically spread and look at target voters in a way that they just don't. Or they could take the path of least resistance, try to keep the noisy voices happy and find that the less interested but more numerous voters turn against them and they could actually start to lose those gains just by doing that. You know, both Labour and the Lib Dems at this election decided to focus on vote efficiency. They both consciously sacrificed votes in areas that either they were already comfortable with or they weren't going to win anyway, in order to focus on winning seats that were difficult but achievable. And seats are the metric of power in our system. Now, the Green Party could do the same. It will be harder. They're a smaller party. They don't have as much money. And it takes money to get surveys and data scientists to analyse it and tell them exactly what they need to do in order to make their vote more efficient. But they could do that. Or they could take the view that the way they've been doing things has earned rewards and why fix something if it ain't broke. Either path is a risk. They could adopt either strategy and hold on to their wins, maybe extend them, or they could adopt either strategy and lose it all within the next 10 years. But I do think the greater gain potential is to be made by correctly identifying target voters, target seats, and listening to those people more than the ones with the megaphones. But there we are. Those are my thoughts. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe for further content and click the like button. You can also sign up for memberships if you'd like to support the channel further. Thanks for watching. Until next time, I'll see you later.